Man has an idea. The idea attracts others, like-minded. The idea expands. The idea becomes an institution. What was the idea? We are talking about the new Crow movie today. Hello, my name is Kat and welcome to my channel where we talk about all things horror, usually, except for today because we're talking about The Crow 2024, which has no horror in it. I have to be honest with you all, this was such a miserable viewing experience. I had seen trailers for this. I knew it was going to be bad. It also didn't help that I went back and rewatched the original 1994 Crow before seeing this one because I hadn't seen it in a while so I wanted to like refresh myself. And yeah, this newer version is just... it's soulless. It is two hours long. I'm telling you all right now, it takes one hour and 20 minutes an hour and 20 minutes before he becomes like the full-on like crow and goes out to get his revenge. An hour and 20 minutes. So I'm sure y'all wondering if that's the case then there's really only like 15 20 minutes of like actual like crow stuff happening. What is going on in the rest of the movie? Well not a lot but the little that they do have they drag out for so many scenes. There was a point when I pulled out my phone to check the time and I saw that we were only 50 minutes into the movie and that we had a whole other hour to go before it was over. I think I started disassociating from the movie at this point. This is the only film that I've seen this year where I had such an intense urge to get up and leave. And there were a few people in our theater that did get up and leave like after the 30 minute mark. They were the smart ones, not me. And like, here's the thing, okay? Don't get mad at me. I really enjoy the original Crow for what it is. I think that it has a lot of positives. Obviously, Brandon Lee, it is still to this day tragic that we lost him at such a young age. He had so much potential. You have the great Ernie Hudson as well. Like the whole aesthetics of just the 1994 version are so on point and just so intentional and it really captures that like gothic feel. It has strong performances and it has strong aesthetics. What I don't think the 1994 version has is a strong story. Again, I don't mean disrespect, but the story to the 1994 one, like especially having seen it again recently, like it's pretty clunky. And I know that part of that was of course due to the tragedy that happened on set and them having to like really save this movie in the editing room. So while I enjoy the 1994 film, I don't consider myself like a super fan. I wasn't really part of the subcultures that the film takes on, right? Whether that's like the goth culture or the alt-rock crowd. And despite the narrative being a little bumpy at times, it still does things so much better than what this new film does. And I'll say off the bat here too, this new film, the 2024 film, it is not a remake of the 90s version. It is trying to be its own thing, so I guess we can give it some like positive points for that. I am also someone that is not that familiar with the comic, with the original source material. My brief knowledge of the comic, it doesn't feel like this new film is really being a straight adaptation, but this new version may be bringing in more elements from the comic that I am just not familiar with. It's probably unfair to compare this new version to the 90s version, but both versions are still using the same IP as inspiration. And I think when we get into the discussion of what didn't work about this new version, talking about what did work in the original is going to help to give examples about why this new one felt like it faltered. So let's get into it. The only other positive that I can say about this movie is Bill Skarsgård. Not even that I thought his performance was like groundbreaking by any means. He's definitely done better work, but he did help elevate this a little bit, just having his presence on screen. He is definitely one of my favorite contemporary actors. I've loved him from the first time that I saw him in that weird like Hemlock Grove Netflix show that came out in, like the mid 2010s, I think. Obviously turned out a great performance as Pennywise in the new It films as well. And while he's trying, there are also scenes where it kind of feels like the filmmakers were just holding this poor man hostage. And I think that's just because the script didn't give him like anything to do. A lot of the character of Eric Draven in this story is him just like standing around and being sad. Every time they did a close-up of him 
you just saw like this tiny little like teardrop tattoo and every time i saw that i just wanted to start laughing he's just a sad boy fka twigs who plays our shelly her character has a tattoo on her hand and the tattoo says something like laugh now cry later and she says like oh this is kind of like my mantra in life and he just goes my mantra in life is cry now cry later. And when he said that, I just wanted to vomit all over my theater seat. I just don't enjoy these kinds of movies or these kinds of characters where it's like, okay, let's be sad 100% of the time. Life is sad. We're sad. You need to be sad too, audience. I just don't find it that entertaining. And I also don't know like why he was so sad even from the beginning. They set up this very weird scene like right at the start of the film where we see a young Eric Draven and he's running towards this horse that got caught in like this razor wire fence and is dying and we see the young Eric Draven just kneeling by the horse and, and crying and being sad. I have no idea what the hell that was supposed to mean or what that was supposed to symbolize or you know what we're supposed to learn about his childhood from that. It's just one note character. He doesn't change from the beginning to the end really despite going through this like you know crazy like physical transformation and if we're thinking of like the original film obviously the character of Eric Draven works because you have someone like Brandon Lee who had a lot of charisma, had a lot of talent that was coming in and giving a lot to the role. His character was also on the more like playful side. Even though he was dealing with this immense grief, there was still a playfulness to his character. Victims, aren't we all? This is a playfulness that we see when the film gives us like those uh, flashbacks of him and Shelley before they were both murdered. And we get to see glimpses of their life and how happy they were. As I was watching this new film and seeing our new Eric and Shelley just sit around and be mopey and say dumb shit like, if you ever find that I'm hard to love, just love me harder. I don't know what the hell that's supposed to mean. And I just kept thinking of the moment in the original film where it's going through like a series of flashbacks. And there's like just one particular moment where we see Shelly in the kitchen. She's trying to cook a meal, but it just comes out so poorly. And then we just see her and Eric laughing about it. And Eric is saying something like, okay, we're just gonna go to a restaurant. Restaurant. <laughs> It was such a brief moment, but it was like so cute and it felt like such a real couple moment. It's like these little moments. It's not sit down and look into each other's eyes, say things like, what was the first thing that you fell in love with me? Tell me I'm the only one that you've ever loved. Yes, obviously love and the strength of love is a very strong theme in just the crow universe in general. But again, when you think of like the moments of the original that I just like talked about, like very simple. And again, we get to see them like actually happy and enjoying each other and enjoying life. And that's what makes it so tragic when he loses her. Whereas here it's like their me cute is so convoluted. He's at a, a rehab, which feels like a prison, but is supposed to just be, I guess, a rehab facility. He's there for reasons that the film never gets into. I asked my friend, um, who I saw this with. I was like, why was he even in that rehab facility? And my friend was like, oh, I just assumed it was because he was sad about his horse dying. So I guess maybe that's what the horse at the beginning was supposed to symbolize. Jury's still out on that one. Anyway, so he's at this rehab facility. She ends up getting in there through again, these very like complicated means where she has a running with the police. They find drugs on her and then um, they bring her to this prison rehab. And so we have to see them meeting at this like facility and people are bullying him. And she's like nice to him. And it's kind of weird because they set up through dialogue that like the men and women can't interact with each other. But yeah, it's so easy for them to like go and like see each other in their rooms and like sit with each other at lunch. Like no one's really enforcing the rules here. They eventually break out of the facility. And again, there's just like no security around at all. And then they go back to this very like grand apartment. It's very like posh and modern. And he's like, oh, you live here. And she's like, no, this is just like my friend who's, you know, traveling right now. And he lets me stay here sometimes. It's like, well, isn't that convenient for you? But like, again, it just feels so cold compared to the original. Those moments, like it just feels so much more natural, right? Like these are two normal people who have jobs. 
he has his band that he does. They're getting ready to get married on Halloween. It's very cute. I'm sure many of us have like these quirky couples that we know. I just had two friends that got married in Vegas and they had an Elvis impersonator marry them, right? Like we know these kinds of people. And again, their apartment like kind of run down in this run down building, but they managed to make it work and it still felt somewhat cozy. There was just something real and natural about what we're seeing in the original that makes you believe the grief a lot more than what we get in this new film. Like we get more Eric and Shelley in this new movie, but I couldn't tell you what it is about each other that they like or that they enjoy. So it's just hard, like when the rest of the movie happens and then he's running around being like, oh, my love, I lost my love, I have to avenge my love. I just didn't buy it. And the thing is, is that going into this, like I, kind of wanted to see more of Eric and Shelley's story. I was like, okay, yeah, let's get a little bit more substance than just the flashbacks. But then they just like dragged it on for so long. FKA Twigs, like I know she's a singer. I'm not that familiar with her music. As far as her acting goes, we'll just say there's room for improvement. And I think the problem is, is that if you're going to do a story like this, you need to have two actors that have like really great chemistry to really sell it. Again, to at least sell it on this like level that they're doing here of like, this is this guy's greatest love that he has lost. And I just didn't feel like Skarsgård and FKA Twigs had good chemistry here at all. Maybe if the film had spent more time showing us like these little moments between couples, like what we get in the original, instead of having like weird, I don't know what they think it is, if they think it's like modern dialogue that they think the kids are gonna like go gaga over of like, oh, yes, tell me about the first time you fell in love with me. You feel like my pets. Like, I don't wanna hear about your love. I wanna be able to see your love. That's what's going to get me to feel sad when the tragic thing happens to both of you. So that's like the love stuff, the relationship stuff. As far as the antagonist in this movie goes, to go from someone like Top Dollar that has such a iconic look and iconic voice and is not the villain that we typically see, in Hollywood films, rewatching the original, like it was just kind of refreshing to see that kind of character. Whereas here we get standard run of the mill, milk toast, old white man that doesn't even do that much in the movie. I mean, talk about like picking the most boring, safe, antagonist. Just like this old white man that just like stands around and is just like, mm, yes, I love opera. And that's all he does in the movie. He has this supernatural power where he's able to take people's souls and he takes people's souls by like getting in their ear and like whispering something to them. I don't even know what he tells them. For being the main antagonist, he's not in this movie that much. The few scenes that we get with him is, yeah, him doing ASMR whispering in people's ears or it's him literally sitting at the theater and watching opera. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to get from that. You also find out that he he made a deal with the devil to steal people's souls and then those souls go to hell and in exchange for that he is able to have eternal life. Why he wants eternal life I don't know, I guess just because he's old and scared of dying. But again, to go back to Top Dollar, let's think about this antagonist for a second. He has that whole like great speech in the original film where it's like he wants to burn the city of Detroit to the ground. He has created this club, this like organization in which every year people are going out and committing these like horrible violent crimes, burning buildings down, terrorizing people, like he's having control over this city. And so when Halloween comes around again and he's meeting with his crew and he's saying like, you know, this year we have to do something different. Problem is, it's all been done before. What I'm saying. And the crew is like, oh, like, why, why would we need to do something different? And he says, he's like, because our brand of chaos that we've created has become a, a brand, right? It's become this like commercialized thing. Devil's night greeting cards. Isn't that precious? The idea has become the institution, boys. And so we have a character with clear motivation, right? A clear point of view. And he has a philosophy that even though he's a terrible person and you as an audience like don't agree with him at all, at the same time, you can kind of see where he's coming from with just this annoyance around things that become like a brand or become like commercialized or the fact that it's like people are gonna start something like a movement and then it becomes like trendy. It becomes part of the mainstream and then everyone wants to do it and just how annoying 
that can feel. So like even though he's a horrible person, like you can kind of see where he's coming from in some ways. Seeing it again, it very much reminded me of something like um, Heath Ledger's Joker. And all of this is what makes him a really interesting antagonist. This is a thing with like good storytelling. Like you always want your protagonist and antagonist to mirror each other in some way. And in, in the original, I think both of those characters do mirror each other. They're actually both characters that are experiencing grief. Eric with the loss of Shelley and then Top Dollar with the loss of his father. And that's what makes them like compelling opponents of each other. That's what helps raise the stakes. So when they are fighting, you know, there is the question there of like, who is going to win this battle at the end? And here in this new film, like you just don't get any of that because again, the antagonist, the old man is not fleshed out at all. I have no idea what his motivation was to make a deal with the devil. There's like a line of dialogue where one of the characters says to um, Bill Skarsgård like, oh, I see like the same look in your eyes that he has in his. You are both people that hate who you are inside or something like that. You can say that, but me as an audience, I have no idea what that means. I have no idea why Eric Draven in this film hates himself so much. Did he kill that horse at the beginning? I still really want to know what was up with the horse. I don't know why the old man hates himself. So when they come together at the end, like it just doesn't feel that climactic. It doesn't feel that interesting. Brandon Lee was so great in the original because yes, he was doing all of his own stunts, but he also just came across as like your normal everyday guy. And I think that does also help raise the stakes in some sense because he is is not this like towering guy. Like we kind of get with Skarsgård who is like so tall. He's clearly taller than like the old man. He's clearly more buff. Of course it's gonna be simple for him to take down this old guy. Like why wouldn't it be? And it felt like they maybe were trying to do something with like, you know, the fact that you have this old guy that's like going around and, and stealing people's souls and he needs to get this, um, I guess like high that he gets from stealing people's souls in order to like stay alive. You have Eric who's I guess a drug addict, maybe. It felt like they were maybe trying to do something with addiction, but but like most things in this film, it just had no follow through. So yeah, there were just like no stakes in this movie. At the end of the film, he literally walks into the old man's house. Again, no security. The old guy knows that he's coming after him, but it's just like chilling in his house. And then like, it's over. Boring. In this one, the old guy does have his like crew of people around him, but I couldn't tell one apart from the other because they're just these guys in suits that show up and then get killed. Whereas in the original, like not that everyone in Top Dollar's gang was that flushed out of a character, but they at least had their very distinct personalities. There is a woman character who I guess is supposed to be the equivalent of sister in the original. What I loved about the sister character in the original, like she was just so weird and she had this kind of like sixth sense about her. She was a very like kind of witchy character in a lot of ways and she always had this thing with like people's people's eyes. And so at the end of the film when she gets her eyes gouged out by the crow that is a satisfying moment right because again we're coming full circle here. You have set something up with this character that then comes back at the end right. It wasn't there for no good reason or just for filler. Aside from Eric who is kind of a nothing character in his own right like it's hard for me to talk about it because there there's literally nothing, nothing. This film gave me nothing to any of these other characters. There are points in this film where once Eric has passed over and he's in this kind of weird afterlife place that, you know, looked pretty cool and could have been interesting if they had actually wanted to do something with that. And he meets up with this guy that's hanging there. You've seen him in the trailers. I don't know who this person is. I don't know why he's there. They kind of suggest that he might be some sort of, I don't know, guardian angel type figure, but he's not like a, a mentor character. It's not like he's coming in and being like, okay, Eric, you've passed over. This is why. And this is what you need to do. He just like comes in casually every once in a while and is like, you need to kill these bad people. And then he'll walk away. And it's like, well, who are you? What, what is your purpose? in this story. He even says like, oh, I don't have the power to like give you your like super strength or the ability to come back from death. Why are you here? Who are you? Who was that guy? I don't know. I still don't know. There's no like Sarah character. I think what was nice about the Sarah character and uh, Detective Albright in the original is that they're two people that embody this other theme that we see with the crow, which is this idea that as long as you keep the memories of your loved lost ones, then that helps to keep them alive in your heart. And that feels very grounded in reality and very true to life. And I think very relatable. And there's just none of that here. I don't know what this one was trying to say about grief. Also, um, spoiler 
spoiler alert. If you don't want to be spoiled, like click ahead. Okay, but getting into spoilers, at the end, Eric is able to bring Shelly back to life. So it is this weird like time thing where we see her with the paramedics and they are able to save her and then she's able to live a full happy life. I feel like it just completely dilutes the themes around death and grieving and the thing that I just mentioned of like keeping someone's memory alive. It really was not that satisfying of an ending and it just felt like bad YA novel writing. I already kind of mentioned this at the beginning of the review, but I think one of the reasons why the original works so well, despite not always having a clear narrative, is that it does have this very like whimsical quality to it. We start and end the movie with Sarah's voiceover, so we're having that childlike perspective coming in. It very much sets up the film as this kind of fairy tale almost. While I don't think The Crow is like strictly like horror movie, it does bring in horror elements to it, right? I think of like the moment when he's coming up out of the grave, right? It feels almost like something out of a zombie movie. And again, the whole thing with it taking place around Halloween and you have people dressed up in costumes that are running around. Like there was such this like dark whimsicalness to the original film and there's like nothing of that in this film. Like aesthetic wise, bland, no playing with colors, no playing with lighting. And the gothic element of it is completely gone. There were also no like cool pro POV shots, right? In the original we get those shots of the crow flying around. We get none of that here. The soundtrack, I mean, yes, you get a few like alt rock tracks coming in every now and then, but for most of the time you're hearing a lot of opera music. Again, because the old guy really likes opera, he's at the opera a lot. While the original is kind of like a comfort movie and one that I would gladly revisit, especially around Halloween time, this film, like, I just never want to watch it again. I think it would be best if we just forgot about this and just look forward to Nosferatu, which Bill Skarsgård looks amazing in and looks like a way better film than The Crow 2024. So those are my overall thoughts on this film. Did you see it this weekend as well? If so, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. What did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? Did I completely like missed something about this and this is really like a masterpiece that I just didn't get. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below and I will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching.